The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today is such an exciting day and today I'm very excited and blessed to bring you a lesson. And today what we're going to talk about is, is I'm going to reveal a snare. If you know anything about this ministry and about this church, some of the things that we focus on very heavily is one, definitions. I focus very heavily on teaching definitions because I want you to be rooted and grounded in what things mean because how something is defined is also the way in which we understand it. So we focus very heavily on definitions. But the other thing we focus very heavily on is understanding snares or exposing the traps of the enemy, the things that he does against us to try to get us to move off of our faith to try to get us to not receive from God. This is very important in walking out your purpose. So for provision and obedience, part number 59, we are going to expose one of the greatest snares that the enemy uses to get people to move from off of their faith when walking out their purpose. Try to get them in fear or in unbelief. Charles Capps used to do a sermon called The Cure for Fear, Doubt, and Unbelief. And this is one of those divine secrets that men of faith have taught for so long. That John G. Lake taught when it came to healing. That Charles Capps taught when it came to sowing and reaping. That Curry Blake taught when it came to healing. That so many great men and women of faith have taught for years. Is the understanding of this snare today. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray... And then we're going to get right into it. We're going to start in 1 Kings 17. And then I'm going to unveil some things out of the Word and give you some personal testimony of how I walk with God. So let's jump right in. Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this Word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's start by doing this. Let's go to 1 Kings 17. We're going to start in verse 1 and let's read through this passage. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, Before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook chariot that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have 
commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And then that leads into the story of Zarephath. Now, today we're not going to focus mainly on the brook. But we're going to actually skip ahead a little bit. And we're going to look at something that the enemy uses to try to ensnare believers into traps to where they will move off their faith and not receive from God. I'm not going to teach this principle today, but there is a spiritual law called the spiritual law of shutting up. I taught this a little over a week ago on a Saturday and a Sunday. It's Elijah part nine, where we talked about if you can't speak in faith, then you should not speak at all. It's better to be quiet than to speak doubt and unbelief. You must always speak in faith. And when we say speak in faith, we mean we say things, we confess things, we declare things according to the truths that we find in the Word of God. That our connection to God releases our ability to declare the goodness and the promises of God in our life. Let me tell you right now, flip to Isaiah chapter 55. I wasn't planning on going here today, but... We'll at least read this verse because it's so important for you to understand this principle. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and that shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it. God says, the word that I sent out of my mouth will not come back void. And not only will it not come back void, it will accomplish and prosper in everything that I have sent it to do. This is the truth you stand on. When God speaks to you and tells you your purpose and tells you your call and tells you, I will sustain you, I will provide for you. I will do everything that I have promised you. This is the word you stand on, Isaiah 55, 11. The word of God will not come back void. It will accomplish and prosper in the thing whereto it was sent. And I tell you this today because in 1 Kings 17, verses 3 and verses 4, Get thee hence. And turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook chariot that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. 1 Kings 17 verses 3 and verses 4 are the words that God used to bring me to Chicago. When I was down in Tennessee. I did not know the two truths that we, two of the truths we see out of 1 Kings 17. Which is the provision of God is where God told you to be. That if you would go where God has told you to be, then you will receive the provision. And that God has already spoken the provision before, he, before you had a need. The provision was made available. And if you will go where God told you, the provision of God is where God told you to be. These two amazing truths in the Bible out of 1 Kings 17 verses 3 and verses 4 are the words that God used when he brought me to Chicago. I want to give you a little bit of my testimony just for a second, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this truth to you today. When God brought me to Chicago, I'll give you a time frame of, of how the events played out. Just, uh, just as an overview, if you've never heard my testimony. When I was in college, I got saved when I was 18. On my, at the end of my second semester, going into my third semester of college. God got me saved. And two months later, I got uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. So two, so I got saved. Uh, I think a month later, 
I got water baptized. A month after that, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And a month after that, God spoke to me and called me into the ministry. I was at a conference that I was helping lead. If you could believe that, it was uh, kind of wild back then. And I was uh, kneeling down at a chair and I was praying because we were praying over this auditorium before this 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 youth uh, conference thing would be going on. And the pastor got up on stage and said, if you want to know what you were called for, what God, you know, what your purpose in life is, ask God, he'll show you right now. And I prayed him, wham, right there. Uh, I saw a vision and God showed me the ministry. God showed me on a stage preaching and right then in that moment called me to the ministry. And it was so crystal clear. There was, there was, no, there was no option. It is what I knew I was supposed to do in life. So I switched my major in college. I did finish college. I just got a different degree, something that would help equip me in the ministry. My last year of college, I was seeking the Lord and I had one last spring break and I was trying to figure out where to go, what to do. And the Lord spoke to me and he spoke my purpose in life. He, he spoke what I was called to do. So let me, let me say this. There's a difference between a purpose and a call. And God said, my purpose was to see the city of Chicago saved in Jesus' name. My call is to church plant, but my purpose was the city of Chicago. This is where I was meant to be. I got married when I was in college, and I moved to Kansas City, Missouri after I graduated, and I was a youth pastor at a church. I ended up leaving the ministry to try to save my marriage because my marriage wasn't working, and that didn't work. And I ended up moving home and ended up having a divorce. For five years after that, I backslid from God. I did not follow the Lord really at all. I don't think I opened my Bible maybe two times. You know, I didn't didn't go to church like at all. But I did pray in tongues because I didn't know the gifts of God were without repentance. The gifts and the callings of God. Um, So... Before I backslid, the Lord spoke to me and said, go to Chicago. Now, there were certain truths that I didn't know out of the Bible. This was one of them. I didn't know that the money was there. I didn't have any money. I think I maybe had $2,000. How was I going to move? How was I going to get a place? How was I going to survive? How was I going to do ministry? I didn't understand any of those things. And because I didn't make the move, I backslid from God. I ended up. Uh, pretty much walking away. Now, I didn't give my faith up, but I walked away. I backslid from God. The very last year of that five years of being backslidden, I went to therapy for a year straight because I needed help. I needed to get my life in order. It had been chaotic. I went through a second marriage and divorce. I had a kid with somebody I wasn't married to. My life was in shambles. I drank so much it almost killed me. I smoked weed pretty much every day. I was smoking a pack of cigarettes. My I was very wealthy and I made a lot of money, but my life was in shambles. And so I was seeking, I was just wanting help, not even seeking God, just just needing somebody to help me get my life in order. And at the end of that year, I wanted to go 52 weeks straight just to get my life in order. And at the end of that year, I had made it one solid year of therapy. My life was pretty much back in order. And I said, you know, I I, I think I want to have a relationship with God again. And so I made that prayer on the 16th of December. Within a week, within two weeks actually, the Lord spoke to me and told me to move to Chicago. Now the immediate answer was no, I wasn't leaving. I I wasn't moving. I had a very high paying job. I had a career. I had, I mean, everything was set up to where I should not move. But then I saw three miracles on the 25th, 26th, and 27th of December. And on that third miracle, I made a decision and made the open confession for the first time that I would obey God. Two days later, I quit my job. I turned my keys in and I was done. Less than two weeks after that, I moved to Chicago. During that two weeks of, of, of seeking God because I was about to root everything up and move, I was going to trust God. This is one of the truths that God showed me was 1 Kings 17 verses 3 and verses 4. It's the verses God used to bring me here. 
And in that two weeks, I saw two open-eyed prophetic visions. Now, I'm not going to go through one of them today because it, it would just take too long. But the other one, the one that was the main one, one of the main ones, was I saw my church building. Florida ceiling windows, blue in color, everything around. The, the stuff across the street had bars on the windows. I saw exactly what my church building looked like. And I knew it was in the south side of Chicago. So everybody that I met for the first three weeks of me being here in Chicago, I told every single person. I told uh, at least three different pastors. And I told I don't know how many other people about this building. And nobody knew where it was at. Three weeks after being here, I found that building. The address is 4646 South Drexel Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60653. It sits right in the middle of Bronzeville. And I found that building. And the Lord, and long story short, the Lord promised that building to me. I had seen it prophetically when I lived in Tennessee. I had not stepped foot in Chicago in over six years. But that building, I had seen it. I knew it was mine. The people did not want to let us have the building. But God said, the next week, he said, get up, go down there, walk around the building seven times, anoint the door and pray for it. So I went down there and did that. You know, there's a foot of snow on the ground, but I did it. And God told me right then, he said, nobody will set foot in that building except for you. That building is yours. It was declared from the throne room of God. We are over a year later. We are obviously we're in April. This was in January of 2022. We were in April of 2023, and we are still standing on this promise. And for the entire time, nothing changed. For months on end, nothing would change. We didn't see the money show up yet. The, we're waiting, we're waiting. The people weren't wanting to lease it to us. They weren't wanting to sell it to us. And I knew God was going to give it to me. I knew we were going to pay for it. God said, paid in full, no debt. And so I kept standing, kept standing, kept trusting God. God promised that to me as long as I wouldn't quit. And I never quit. I never left. I'm still here. And I tell you this truth today, church, because all of a sudden we saw a change. Something happened. Now we got a sign on the building. Something's moving. And a lot of times when people see movement, especially in the opposite direction, they get in fear. They get in doubt. They get in unbelief. And church, I want to tell you, there was another movement on the building. But I want to give you a fundamental divine secret on how faith works to really help you out. Because I believe this is going to bless somebody to really understand this truth. This truth really came to light as I studied healing. I studied healing through John G. Lake Ministries and Curry Blake. And, and this truth came more alive the more I saw it in healing. But it, it applies in every aspect of faith. So let me tell you this. Let's go to 1 Kings 19. I want to read some verses in 1 Kings 19, and then we're going to go right into the New Testament. And then we're going to explain this. But listen to this. 1 Kings 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, I'm not going to talk about the failure of Elijah in this story. We've talked about the failure yesterday, uh, this past week we've talked about this passage. So I'm, I'm not going to re-go into that part again. But what I want you to see is that as Elijah takes steps forward in walking out his purpose, he goes to Cherith, he goes to Zarephath, he goes back to King Ahab and slays 450 prophets of Baal after he called down fire from heaven. And the next thing that happens is Jezebel sends him a letter. Let me say this. If Jezebel was so uh, sure of herself, why didn't she send an army to try to kill him? All she sent was a letter. She didn't send an army. She sent a letter. It was a fear tactic. It's what the devil does. Is the devil tries to do something to get you to move off of your faith and away from your purpose. We see later on that Elijah fails, but God restores him. And God brings him back to at least accomplish some more things before he, he, he turns the ministry over to Elisha. 
But you see it right here in the story that the devil made a move to try to get the purpose of God to stop in the life of Elijah. Go with me to Mark chapter 9. I want to read this story in Mark 9. Let's go to Mark 9. Let's start in verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitudes answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered them and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked the father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe it. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto them, Thou deaf and dumb spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth not but by prayer and fasting. Now let me say this. Without getting into all of this teaching, because we could talk about this entire passage many different ways, I'm going I'm to break one sacred cow real fast, and then we're going to get back into what we're talking about. When Jesus said, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting, he's not talking about the demon coming out. He's talking, or the deaf and dumb spirit coming out. He's talking about the unbelief of the people that's caused them not to receive. Your unbelief leaves when you pray and fast, when you're seeking the Lord, being more connected to God. But let me say this. I just want to mention something about this passage that's very interesting. When you read through all the harmony of this, and even if you look at Luke Luke 9 and read the passage in Luke 9, it says that when Jesus came up, the Spirit immediately tore the boy and threw him down. So what's so interesting about this is that when Jesus is going to operate in faith and use the power of God, the thing that the devil does is, is throw the boy It tries to do something to get the person of faith to move. I believe this is why Jesus was telling the disciples, Oh, faithless generation, this, you know, your unbelief comes out by by prayer and fasting. That's how you get it out. He said, Because when you were doing what you're supposed to, the devil did something, and because of what you saw, you changed what you believed. You decided not to walk in belief, but you decided to move from off your faith. And that's why the demon didn't come out. Let me tell you a divine secret today that will help you out very much. When you're walking out your purpose and you're going to receive a promise of God, a lot of times the devil will do something to get you to move off your faith and off of your confession. Maybe you're believing for healing. And the next thing you know is it gets worse. The situation gets worse. And you look at it and say, man, that's, you know, like, it's, that's not good. And, and then people start moving off their face and they say, well, maybe it didn't work. Maybe I didn't get healed. Maybe this may... 
and they start confessing things outside of their faith. And that's the point. That's the trap. The devil wants you to be focused on circumstances and not on truth. Let me tell you this today. I, I, I love how Curry Blick explained this. He said, so many people with sickness, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. And then you pray for them and then all of a sudden it gets worse. Here's what you need to know. It's moving. And if it's moving, it can move out. The same thing with our church building. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Then it started to move. And then it started to move. Let me tell you today, church, I don't care how it looks, what is going on there. Let me tell you, nobody will step foot in that building except for me. I declare it by the name of Jesus, according to the truth of the word of God, spoken prophetically from the throne room of heaven. Nobody will own that building but me. Nobody will own that building but Blank Slate Ministries. I tell you this today because when you're walking out your faith and you're walking out your purpose and the devil does something and the circumstances go bad, let me tell you, stand in faith. He might be wallowing, but he will leave. In Jesus' name, we're out of time. Father, bless these people. I thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. God, I thank you that our church building is coming our way. The devil's moving and he will move out and we will move in. I thank you for it. I give you all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. Have a wonderful day today. Have a wonderful day tomorrow. Remember, no discipleship this week. Make sure you buy your curriculum. Make sure you're ready to go because we do have class again starting next week. But church, I love you. I pray you have a great week and we will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. God bless you. The sparrows not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lilies not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I? Cause you take good care of me You take good care of me You know what I need Before I even ask a thing And you hold me in your hands With the kindness that never ends I'm carried in your love No matter what the future brings And you take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it cast. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Take good care of me. You take good care.